Ken Forrester, Executive Director at Momenta. Welcome to our Digital Thread Podcast, produced by, for, and about digital industry leaders. In this series of conversations, we capture insights from the best and brightest minds in digital industry. Their executives, entrepreneurs, advisors, and other thought leaders. What they have in common is like our team at Momenta, they are deep industry operators. We hope you find these podcasts informative. And as always, we welcome your comments and suggestions. Good day and welcome to episode 183 of our Momenta Digital Thread podcast series. Today, I'm greatly pleased to host Joe Perino, Principal Analyst, LNS Research. At LNS, Joe focuses primarily on industrial transformation and operational excellence for oil and gas, process manufacturing, and other asset-intensive industries. He also provides collaborative coverage across the industrial internet of things, big data, cloud, advanced analytics, edge computing, the digital twin, robotic process automation, blockchain, and asset performance management. Joe started his career as a process engineer in the refining, chemicals, and pipeline sector, and spent several years in sales and business development with process automation and technology suppliers before moving into product and industry marketing, strategy, corporate development, M&A, and management consulting. Throughout his career, he has helped process manufacturing companies with strategy development, digital transformation initiatives, and market development. Joe holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Notre Dame and a Master of Science in Finance from the University of Houston, Clear Lake. Joe, welcome to our Digital Thread podcast. Thank you, Ken. Glad to be here. I'm glad to have you. And for the backstory, those of you who didn't get a chance to hear what we had talked about before, which is pretty much all of you, we've had some technical difficulties. So this is almost try three for this podcast. So while we're going to talk digital transformation, unfortunately, the digital, at least of Microsoft Teams, has not lived up to uh, expectations for this call. So you'll have to forgive if we sound a little bit not direct on the podcast, but on the flip side, we should be well practiced in our answers. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, with that, you know, we call this the Digital Thread Podcast. And so naturally, we like to ask about your digital thread. In other words, the one or more thematic threads that define your digital industry journey. So, Ken, I'd say there are probably three threads. First, I have always spent my career with the process in energy industries. Uh, and being in Houston, that's pretty easy. Second, I've always stayed in touch with technology and kept up with technology. And third, circumstances in my career dictated that I had to reinvent myself, learn to do new things and develop new skills, and be good at more than one thing, which I've done. And for the listener, I've had 15 jobs since university and been laid off nine times, and yet I'm still here and not ready to quit yet. So you can only control what you can do. You can't control everything else that goes on around you. So you have to be ready to adjust one's direction with your career. And mine has certainly zigzagged a lot. It's interesting when we think about digital transformation of industry, you always think of this as agile sprints, if you will, right? At least done in kind of best practice way. I think sometimes our careers are the same way. Many of us are taught to, let's say, we write our epitaph or, or write the Wall Street Journal article that describes what our future is and somehow work backwards from that. And I found that Anytime I look back, I can see the actual thread that makes up where I'm at now, and I can see those digital threads. That's what came up with that name. Going forward, many times it's a matter of trying these agile sprints, seeing what works and what doesn't until you find your place, which it sounds like you have at LNS. So, Well, yes. In fact, looking back, I can connect the dots. It makes sense. A lot of my experiences are built upon each other. But I can certainly tell you that when I got out of school and started to work as a process engineer in Cleveland, Ohio, and then here in Houston in the plant, I had no idea I'd end up where I am, in particular becoming a consultant later on and doing as much speaking and writing as I do now, and then looking back at it. But you're very true. And the story's not over yet. I'm 67 and I'm not ready to quit. So there's more to be written. Well, we'll talk about what you've written recently because it was inspirational, certainly for us. So if uh, you're going to top that, I'd say there's lots of great things to look forward to. So looking through your bio is interesting. Of course, it was a mouthful introducing you right up the front. But if I kind of look at your bio as a two decade, if you will, who of oil and gas process leadership, I see you at I2 and Schlumberger, CGI, KBC, and even well aware San Antonio based startup that we've followed in the past as well. 
If I had to kind of boil this two decades down into kind of your top three insights working in these front lines of process control, what would those be? Well, and I don't think these are a secret to the listener, but the first is I've been around long enough to witness the transition from a very hardware-oriented situation in the automation space to one that is going to become dominated by software. And it's not that we don't need good hardware or that isn't a profitable business, but success in non-control related software is a real challenge for the automation companies, as it is also for the hyperscalers. The second insight I would say is that some companies are chasing software without a real strategy. And lacking one is going to be very costly because of the sky-high software valuations that are out there. There's a number of firms that are rushing to acquire things, and then they wonder what to do. In fact, from an LNS viewpoint, we see two companies. One that asks us, hey, Joe, we're about to do X or thinking about doing X. Should we do X? And if we do X, how do we position it? And then there's the others that go out and do X and then come and ask for help after they've done it, which is <laughs> not the right time to do it. And uh, probably the third insight is we're still very early in the adoption phase of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I think it's still fairly overhyped in the market. Most end users still really aren't ready for a significant rollout of this technology. And it's probably not necessarily due to the technical issues associated with it, but much more about change management and readiness in the company. So those are my three. Very good ones. And certainly weave into the centerpiece for our Waking the Sleeping Giants discussion today. Before I do, though, I'd be remiss not to talk about LNS. So all of your experience is culminating in you joining LNS, which is an industrial research and advisory. I guess you joined them in 2018, actually. What attracted you to the company and perhaps generally just the advisory, if you will, space? Well, actually, they found me on LinkedIn in July of 18. They had a contract recruiter working out of the Philippines that reached out to me. And the reason for reaching out to me is that a very senior industry analyst, Dan Miklovic, who had spent many years with Gartner and about five years with LMS, was going to pull the plug and retire in about a year. And they were looking for a fairly industry experienced person to replace Dan. And so they found me and they added me on the December team. And then Dan coached me along in the first year and as he phased down to retirement. And I had not heard of LNS before because we're only about 20 people. But what attracted me was the chance to bring all the culmination of all my past experiences to bear as an analyst, having been in the shoes of our two primary groups of clients. One are the software vendors and hardware vendors, the automation firms and the software people like Aviva and Aspen Tech. And the other are the end users who we're increasingly adding to our list. And I've also been a service provider and a consultant and an end user before. So I've basically been on every side of the equation. And what makes LNS different is that our focus is on industrial transformation and more on the operational side of the business as opposed to the CIO, although we do cover CIOs. The other thing that makes us different is that unlike many of our supposed competitors, we are not the echo chamber for the marketing department of vendors. So while we do write about vendors a lot, we provide a lot more insights and advice on the inside of what they should be doing as opposed to simply echoing the message of the marketing departments. And that's proven to be a little bit of a shift in strategy that Matt and Mayhul did two or three years ago, and it's paid off for us. And so we think we're rather unique here. And sometimes we find ourselves competing against a McKinsey or an Accenture more than we compete against an ARC or a Gartner, for example. For anybody who knows, say, the man, the myth, the legend, Dan Miklovic, those are both physically and figuratively large shoes that you had to fill. <laughs> well, I don't know that I've filled them all, but I've replaced him anyway. And I hope Dan is having an enjoyable time in his retirement. Yeah. Uh, and he's still out there because he's still part of this other kind of ex-analyst group that does write here and there occasionally. But yep. he's not certainly not doing anything full time in the space anymore, as far as I can tell. Yeah, he's a great guy. Certainly a long track record. So all of this really kind of for the, our conversation, it culminated in a recent article you published in the LNS Industrial Transformation blog titled Waking Sleeping Giants, Releasing the Kraken. The title alone is inspirational enough or at least provocative enough. Our Momenta team actually found this to be quite insightful given our digital industry investment focus. As you chronicled, really, the digital transformation journey of the top automation vendors, ABB, Emerson, Honeywell, Rockwell Automation, Schneider Electric, Siemens, and Yokogawa. What's inspired you to write the article? Well, I had originally developed the zone of transition diagram for one of our clients because we were discussing with them 
where the automation companies are headed and their challenges that they face. And so it very much reminded me of the Gartner hype cycle curve and the change management curve. And so I said, I want to write a blog about that. And Matt, why don't you add on and talk about that relative to what the automation vendors are doing in this space? Because they're really challenged. So I took that on to write that and I expanded it. And fortunately, when we are able to do blogs at LMS, we can use a little bit more catchier title, which is why you've seen the word the releasing the Kraken, which by the way, by that I mean the software Kraken. And so we wrote that and I got quite a bit of view on that, not only on our own website, but I think about a thousand LinkedIn views of that article. I can imagine, you know, Mike Dolbeck, who's our managing partner for Adventures, uh, GE days, I'm sure. But Mike and I actually took this as part of one of our venture team meetings over actually a couple of weeks. And we had each of the members of our venture team play effectively the CEO for each of those companies you outlined. So we had them go and look up the strategies. Then we came back and looked at the corp dev heads perspective of the same companies. Who are they likely to acquire? Obviously, for venture investors, you want to be ahead of that curve, right? But we really took this to heart because I think, one, I think you picked really good companies. And two, I think you were quite insightful and probably not too complimentary. And I mean that in a positive way. You took a critical view of the journey that they've still got to play. And you said it earlier, this is still at the very front end. And a lot of people think, oh, digital transformation, IoT, industrial IoT, these are like hitting the trough of disillusionment. But some of these are still relatively early from any hype cycle perspective. And I think, you know, you pick some large companies that are slowly feeling their way into it, some better than others, which I think you chronicled well. Yeah. Well, each of these companies, they're all open to acquisitions and they have some activity going on there. And yep. in fact, we'll note that next week it's Emerson and Aspen Tech's turn yep. coming up. Yep. And, but all of them have taken a little bit different approach. I think one of the lessons that some of them still need to learn is, is that if you're going to sell enterprise software, you need to have an enterprise sales force. You're not going to do it with automation people. And hence, I think Emerson realized that and is doing what they're doing. Honeywell, I worked for both Emerson and Honeywell in my career. Honeywell took a long time to get around to creating the connected enterprise team in tackling that. Others have a different approach, but they're all faced with increasing amounts of software. They're all faced with open process automation systems in progress, as we speak, uh, coming. And they're also faced with the decoupling of software from hardware. And so I think we're actually can, we're at a really a, an inflection point in this history. The big one being the start of DCS back in the late 70s when Yokogawa and Honeywell came out with it. And it's matured quite a bit since then. And these systems are very good and they're very reliable. But now things are opening up. And the ISA 95 architecture is flattening a bit. And so there's a new challenge. And this is going to be something that's going to get phased in, I think, over the decade and into the 2030s. And it's a real challenge for these guys to tackle this. Let me give you an example. A lot of these vendors have a huge installed base of what we call technical data, meaning installed users. Some of them have, for example, ABB has five control systems one of which is the Taylor Mod 300 that Taylor built for Dow that dates back to 1984. Some of this is still out there, as is TDC 2000. So what do you do? And a lot of these systems, yeah, you can migrate forward, but you can't make migrate forward to the current capability. So there's going to be a lot of rip and replace that I think is going to occur in the next 15 years. And obviously, these companies don't want to lose the install base, but there's going to be a time where they can't get parts. It's too expensive to support. And end users can't get the newer functionality they want. So I think we've entered a new inflection point phase that will move faster than the development of DCS did from the late 70s to the 90s and to the 2000s. Let me stop there. You hit some great points. And I think the one that's probably the kind of extra outside in is cybersecurity and the potential risk of these older systems, especially given what's going on at the Ukraine and Russia right now. So I, I agree with you that there will be a lot of pressure to migrate these systems or to modernize many of them in that. Let me ask about that. You introduced something called the zone of transition earlier. So if in my perspective, it's digital maturity model, kind of like, as you say, the Gartner hype cycle or maybe the crossing the chasm change management cycle. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we need a specific model for the process automation space? Well, the zone of transition actually applies to all firms. 
But the reason that I think the automation companies face this is because their business model was based on proprietary hardware and associated software that was embedded in it that created a vendor lock-in for a long period of time, sort of an early version of ARR. And so once you sell a system, you know you're going to get a certain amount of services and spare parts and all that, which you can count on. So the problem they face is with digital disruption, software decoupling, open systems, is that model is going to break down. It's not going to break down completely tomorrow, but they're going to have to figure a way to still win in a more open, decoupled world and pull their base along with it so that they don't lose market share and they don't see their margins drop. And each of these vendors is coming at this from a little bit different angle, and some of them have better financial numbers than the other guys do. And so they have a real challenge. Now, if we compare that, it's not all bad news. IT companies, such as Cisco, have maneuvered their way through having proprietary hardware, and now they have interchangeable hardware like routers with other things, with competitors. And so IT companies, IT people in IT can swap out hardware. Yet they've still been managed to manage that, stay profitable, and stay very relevant. So that's the challenge that they face, that IT has done a better job of maneuvering through. I think the automation companies are going to have some bumpy times ahead maneuvering through this. As we kind of listed those companies earlier on, who do you consider really the leader in the pack? And what have they done that bears repeating by the others? Well, I think it depends on how you define the leader. Do you find it by market share, profitability? Who do you think is technically innovating faster than other people? So, and those things vary by all of those companies. And frankly, most vendor innovations don't provide lasting competitive advantage as functionalities are easily replicated one way or the other. For example, Emerson came out with remote I.O., and now everybody has it. And how long did that take? Less than two years, maybe less than a year before other people did the same thing. There are a few technical innovations I like that stand out to me. For example, I like Honeywell's ability to virtualize controllers in their Hive offering. And apparently they're selling a fair amount of that. And that is one set of I.O. can talk to any controller. Any controller can talk to any I.O. And the controllers back each other up. They're not hardwired back up. They're in a nest of controllers that can back each other up. And one thing I like to point out to vendors is that since most greenfield projects will utilize remote I.O. now, and I always ask them, why do they keep designing rectangular-shaped controllers reminiscent of old single-loop controllers? when they're mounted in racks that sit in an air conditioning building instead of designing controllers that use blade servers and make that look like a data center. They're still stuck with, they can't get away from the old way of building things. And I think if they would be more innovative, they could do that and take advantage of what IT has taken advantage of and still build something that's reliable, fast, and meets the needs of the process control world. So there's some challenges for these people. I don't see the speed of innovation that I'd like to see, that I see in other places in software and, frankly, on the IT hardware side. And speaking of IT, there's certainly another group of giants that didn't get mentioned in this article, but the so-called hyperscalers, right? Uh, AWS, Google, Microsoft. What impact do you think they will have on the traditional IoT giants? Well, they're already impacting the giants. A lot of the level three software like advanced planning and scheduling MES and MOM, the engineering software, CAD, PLM, simulation, uh, even control system testing, plus all the analytics, that's all shifting to the cloud and some to the edge as well. And so I don't see the hyperscalers in the plant at the control system level, necessarily saying level two, where the controllers are. They are there at the edge. And what keeps them from playing there is probably better places to go, the lack of domain knowledge uh, that they have to leverage end user know-hows to apply their products. All of the automation vendors and others are going to be dependent on one of the three or more than one of these hyperscalers. And their business model is pretty simple. We want you on our platform. So all roads lead to Rome. That's what they want. And so they're going to do whatever they can to attract applications to their platforms. They're not trying to tell the control system vendors, move your control system to our platform. But the development tools, the testing tools, all the other level three software is moving to their platforms. And the game, of course, is to develop such a strong position that you have a dominance in terms of volume and cost advantage. That's the game that they're playing. But on the other hand, over time, Ken, frankly, these guys are going to become commodities in terms of what they do, the services are, because there's not a whole lot of difference between Amazon and Azure 
in terms of the components that sit out there. There is a difference in how they go to market, how they partner, what kind of deals they cut, how they incentivize their partners. Those are differences that are real. And that's where a lot of the battle is. Mm. Every industry has its digital disruptors. They call it the Elon factor, if you will, like Tesla for automobiles or SpaceX for space travel. Do you foresee that we'll see such a disruptor for industrial and process automation? And if so, could you hazard a guess in terms of time frame? Well, we're seeing that disruption now with what I mentioned with the decoupling of software with hardware and the open systems. I think that's going to take at least to the end of the decade, those two things, to mature enough to where people are going to say, yeah, we're going to just put in an OPAS compliant system. It's going to take a while. And we don't know which vendors are going to be leading in that area. Probably Schneider and Yokogawa will move sooner than others. And that's my guess based on their activity and what they're doing. None of them have actually announced that they're going to go there. The other area I think that's probably ripe for disruption is legacy MES, manufacturing execution systems. There's a lot of them out there. They're rigid. They don't scale. And that is being disrupted now by startups in the industry that are basically componentizing or making it composable to have your own manufacturing execution system, however you want to define it. And so that way, a small plant can start with five or six functions, and they don't need to buy the whole enchilada, so to speak, with the cost and the two-year implementation program. So that's an area that's going to be disrupted. And then I think the third area that you'll see disruption is that we're already seeing correlative artificial intelligence. I use the word correlation. What we haven't seen yet, which is coming, is causal AI. And causal AI reasons and make choices that humans do. And it's mostly at the university level now, but I know of at least one end user that is using that technology in their customer supplier management end of the business. And it's actually supplementing and fixing a lot of things that the ERP system won't do right. Because the ERP systems of record are still rigid, transactional, step after step after step workflow systems. And when you run into a problem, then humans have to take over and go fix the issue. And the idea with causal AI is that the machine will tell the human what to do and fix the problem so that the transaction can continue moving forward. You're going to see more of that coming out of university and into the systems theory as we move forward in the next five to 10 years. Well, that's one I'll definitely have to note. You know we're avid investors in the space. So beyond causal AI, what other trends and startups are you watching these days? All right. So I'm watching three trends that I particularly like to write about. One is operational excellence, 4.0, and it's tied to industrial transformation. That's one. The second one I just mentioned, autonomous operations, which I've written about, and the role of correlative and causal AI in that. There's a system of system challenge to actually get to autonomy, and autonomy is a lot more than just having your control system run itself. There's a lot more to autonomous operations than that. And then the third one is what we're watching is this future of work issue. So by that, I mean the issue around attracting and keeping talent, the great resignation, people don't come to work, they don't stay at the companies anymore. What do you do when your most mature worker is only four years on the job and you don't have the 30-year people anymore? That's actually the biggest problem that manufacturers face is this people issue and the skills issue that goes along with it. Those are the three big trends. Yeah. I think the third one particularly is a very interesting course because we do a lot of exec search work. So we're seeing that firsthand. Now, if we go to the startup space, well, there's four areas that we track and I'll mention some names because some of these people are our, our clients. We're watching analytics vendors, of course, and I'm actually doing an analytics solution selection matrix guide right now. And that includes everybody from C3 to uh, say a small firm like Quartic that's out there. And we've just watched Argory by SIBO, for example. So we're keeping an eye on that. The second thing we're keeping an eye on, which is related to the future of work thing, is connected frontline workforce software. And there's about 20 vendors in that space and that are working on software that facilitates factory for worker safety and effectiveness. So I'm not talking about operator rounds. I'm talking about use cases in asset management, in EHS, in safety, in all of these things that are all facilitated by one piece of software that handles all the collaboration around workers working together and working as individuals. This is a very hot area right now. And there's a lot of players out there and a lot of white space to be gained. Two people we're watching very closely are Augmenteer and Red Zone, for example, that are out there. And the third area is these vendors that I'll call manufacturing performance systems. They're using data models of the production system to inform and optimize. So 
they're doing something we might call wrapping and extending around existing MES or even replacing an MES, in, at least in a small space. So there's sort of the Namur approach to wrapping and extending, whether you're compliant with Namur and using OPC UA or not. So these are firms that are like BrainCube, Sight Machine, Tulip, Twin Thread, Think IQ, Odin, Machine Metrics, people in that space that are there. And finally, a fourth one is none of this happens without data access, data management, data democracy. This is a big deal. How do you architect the data at the plant and in the corporation and be able to scale it? And so this takes us into the data ops space. And I've written about data hubs and IT calls all this a data fabric. And the players in there are mostly startups, uh, Cognite, Element, Uptake Fusion, Kepware, part of PTC, Hybyte, Inmation from Germany is in that space. There's even a new startup that spun out of Trendminer called Timeseer that just focuses on data quality. So this is out there. And this is all about bringing the three types of data, structured, unstructured, and time series together and putting it in a way such that applications, whether it's a BI tool or a digital twin, can access that data in a standard way and consume it. And this is something that all the end user firms are challenged to architect right now and figure out how to do this. So do they dev op it from scratch? Do they buy components? Do they buy most of it rolled together in one solution? How do they do this? And then an offshoot of this is this contextualization space in which you decide whether you're going to do it the traditional way, which is a hierarchical canonical mapping of data together, or do you use object technology, or do you use what's pretty hot now? It's been around a while, like 15 years, and that's graph technology. That's a hot space. So there you have vendors like Neo4j, Cambridge, Redis, and others to keep an eye on. And most of those, again, are startup money. They have VC money behind them. And so I think you're going to see a lot of activity there as graph technology works its way into the industrial data management space. I'll stop right there. Wow. An area where I wish you wouldn't stop, but of course, we're coming up on the end of our time here. But thank you for the plugs, by the way, for several portfolio companies, including a high bite and sight machine. So in closing, I guess, what are you reading or watching these days that really inspire you? Well, I wasn't sure how to answer that question, whether that was what am I doing in the business space? What am I doing with my personal time? When I contemplated the answer about my personal time, when I have it, because I am watching and reading a lot of things going on. I'm, I follow what's going on on LinkedIn quite closely, and LNS is taking advantage of that. In fact, you'll see Matt has a blog almost every day in the morning in there with a snippet of insights or our research that he puts on and some of the other salespeople that are working for us and other analysts do the same thing. And occasionally I'll pipe in. From a personal side, if I get a chance, I like to watch sports and I also like to read about history, U.S. history as well as world history. And so I try to keep up also with a little bit of science on the climate change side because we're following that very closely now because of the sustainability and ESG movements that are out there now that we're tying in. And the business theme challenge around that is a lot of companies, of course, have had to make commitments to net zero, but they haven't really figured out how to get there. So it's one thing to say we'll be net zero as an industrial firm. It's another thing to actually figure out how to get there. And so we're following that pretty closely too. Very good. And you answered the question the way I hadn't intended to. So thanks for that. So Joe, thank you for sharing this time and these great insights with us today. Well, Ken, thank you again. I appreciate the time with you and your listeners. And you can reach me again, of course, on LinkedIn or through LNS. And I'm happy to answer any questions your listeners might have as a follow-up. Perfect. So this has been Joe Perino, Principal Analyst at LNS Research. Thank you for listening. And please join us for the next episode of our Digital Thread podcast series. Thank you and have a great day. You've been listening to the Momenta Digital Thread podcast series. We hope you've enjoyed the discussion. And as always, we welcome your comments and suggestions. Please check our website at momenta.one for archived versions of podcasts, as well as resources to help with your digital industry journey. Thank you for listening.